My name is Elizabeth Hillman. Um, I uh, work at Columbia University in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and ha also have an appointment in radiology. Um, I've been there for almost six years and uh, I'm the director of the Laboratory for Functional Optical Imaging, which specializes in developing and applying optical techniques for imaging living things. We're primarily driven by this question about the brain, but a lot of our techniques now have spanned out into other areas like skin cancer and other kinds of cancers and gastrointestinal tissues and, and you know, heart, heart activity, things like that. The work that we're doing could have a high impact on understanding um, functional brain imaging modalities that are used in humans like functional MRI um, and even PET studies. And so um, really being able to provide the information about what those techniques are actually measuring and um, you know, assist with interpretation of that data and guide imaging paradigms to, to fit better um, to the sorts of physiology that's going on. Um, could have a real impact. Also the techniques that we're developing, generally uh, so far we've, we've done a lot of stuff in sort of normal, normal uh, models but they can be readily applied to new models of disease. We've been working recently looking at development in the brain um, and also recently looking at glioma and how glioma develops and so if we can provide answers about you know how glioma cells migrate through the brain and maybe even use our systems to look at potential therapies and say, well, how do they affect the way that glioma cells migrate through the brain? You know, how does this treatment work and, and why, does it, why does it change the outcome in a, in a human? We've, we've been able to provide something that can really be directly applied to human treatment, um, but without our modalities necessarily being used directly on a human. One of our biggest interests is um, being able to understand the brain and particularly to um, understand blood flow in the brain. And um, it's very challenging to understand blood flow in any kind of system that doesn't have blood flow, which means that we really need to do this in living, uh, the living brain, the intact living brain. Um, are there rare opportunities to do that in humans? Um, and uh, so we very often use animal models. Initially, a lot of the work that we did is we wanted to observe the brain. We wanted to um, just really get in there and, and, and measure as many things as we could at once in parallel to see you know what was happening especially when you know when you when you stimulate the 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 hand you see an increase in blood flow in a, in a region of the brain and we wanted to really map out exactly what was happening there um, in terms of all the cells and all of the vessels but you know then you get to a point where you're able to sort of build a model and actually say, well, we think we understand how this happens. And the only way you can prove that is to be able to actually then modify it in some way or change it. And so that's got us really interested in techniques that can actually affect change in the brain or in tissues um, to, to then perturb something or test something or block something. And uh, one new very exciting technology that's able to do that is optogenetics. Um, so optogenetics is where you uh, introduce um, this uh, a transgenic mutation to a particular cell type which is genetically targeted and allows the cell to express um, a, a light sensitive channel and that channel can either cause the cells to be excited when you shine light on them or you can cause them to be inhibited and no doubt you would cause them to do all sorts of other things as well and so um, this means that you know, we can, we can uh, uh, say, take an animal, use a viral vector to um, uh, cause this transgenic mutation in a subset of particular kinds of neurons, and then we use light itself to actually stimulate those cells. Then we also use light to image the brain to understand what happens as a result of that. Um, but what's really nice is we can sort of use all of those systems together and incorporate them together, and, you know, you really get to see you know, what happens at that moment when you turn that cell on and what happens, you know, in the subsequent 10, 15, 20 seconds. Um, and so it's a really versatile uh, technique that we can then use to look at other cell types um, and, you know, other uh, kind of things. And, and there's other techniques besides optogenetics as well. There's uh, infrared stimulation of the brain. It's kind of an organic process. Like, it, 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 sometimes it's, it's, it's we see something that, that, that sort of stimulates an interest and, and then it grows from there and you know I have a lot of fantastic grad students and, and postdocs and, and other people in the lab who have great imaginations as well and who will come to me with a paper and say I think, I think what we have could do something here you know so it, it's, 
it really it's it's quite variable sometimes everything just meets and matches and comes together beautifully like the the glioma project um you know i i saw a talk where someone was showing mri scans of a tumor and they said well here you can see the tumor it has this enhancement in the mri from the gadolinium and i said you know why why does it have that enhancement like it doesn't make sense to me why you know where you would see that and I got sort of three different answers from three different clinicians and I I just sort of pursued it and I found someone who was working in glioma and that's led to you know not just a, a project where we're trying to understand the way that glioma um, spreads in the brain but has now led to collaborations with neurosurgeons where we're actually imaging the brains of patients during neurosurgery so when the brain is open we're using our modalities to look at the brain and we think we might be close to finding some markers of glioma development that could actually be you know really important for for human brain cancer and it all just came from sort of one initial idea in a talk that i sort of just pursued and happened to find the right connections of collaborators and people that work together really well